Where the hell do we start with all that? Oh my God, the results are just coming in. Mike Turnison takes the victory. Second place, Peter Sagan. Caleb Ewan was third. Nizolo was fourth. Sonny Corbrelli didn't even mention him. Michael Matthews, sixth. Trenton, seventh. And that's all I can see on the news. Oh my God. Right, let's get into this. Stage one of the Tour de France is over. Welcome to Chris Pritchard Cycling News Show. Oh, transition. Right, huge surprise victory there. We're going to get into all the rest of the news later on. Well, I guess we should start with the news of the feud, I guess, that's coming out of Team Dimension Data that was happening this morning before the tour had even kicked off. According to The Telegraph, Doug Ryder, the team principal of Dimension Data, claimed it was a team decision not to select Cavendish who has won 30 stages in his career and still hopes to match Eddie Merckx's tally of 34. Now, 10 minutes later, Ralph Aldag outside the team bus contradicted everything that Doug Ryder said. It's no secret I wanted him here. I think it would sue our strategy, but ultimately it's a team owner decision. It's within my remit to select the team, which I did. I wrote down eight names and Mark was included and the team owner has the right to overrule me, which he did. And that was about it. Now, it's no secret that Rolf Aldag is a, is a huge Cavendish supporter and he, for one, I'm sure would want Cavendish in the team, especially when people are saying that Cavendish was in as good form as he was back in 2016 when he took four stage victories. So there's something uh, more to it than that. And we're going to keep an eye on the story and we will uh, report anything else that happens over the next few days. But don't be surprised to see Aldag being the first to retire from the Tour de France. Now let's move on to the stage and the biggest news. Well, Fuglesang crashed. Looks like Geraint Thomas crashed in the last couple of K. My prediction, Dylan Gurnervegen was caught up in that crash. I, I was watching it on the overhead camera and why he was that far down coming into that sprint, I have no idea. But thankfully, some of his teammates decided to actually race and Mike Turnison took victory over Peter Sagan. Turnison was obviously there to do a job for Dylan Gurnervegen and um, well, Gurnervegen was nowhere to be seen. Had he been up the front, he wouldn't have got involved in that crash. Caleb Ewan was very unlucky towards the end of that race. He got boxed in and there was nothing he could do. He might have been there had he got out of that box, but by the time he got back on the pedals after uh, backing off just a little bit, there was there was nothing he could do. It all came down to Turnison and Sagan. And Sagan had put his head in the wind first and Turnison was able to come around him. And, and... The other news coming out of stage one is one of the favourites, Jakob Fuglsang, one of the favourites that I say is going to be on the podium ended up crashing within the last 20 kilometers. He got back up. When the cameras cut to him, it looked like he was in a bit of shock. He had blood pouring down from his eyebrow and it looked like his, uh, his tour could be over. However, he managed to get to the finish. And it just goes to show you what I said yesterday in the preview about the fact that these riders have to get through the first week when there's these touches of wheels, when there's all this nervous energy within the peloton, they've got to keep a cool head, They've got to stay at the front and they've got to make sure that they get through each stage unscathed because that could have been his tour over. You go through all that preparation and then crash on the first day and be out of the Tour of France. France. But he wasn't the only favourite to go down. Geraint Thomas went down in that crash with about 2k to go that took out the majority of the peloton. He got up and it looked like he's uh, relatively unscathed from that. Hopefully nothing more than just shook up. The crash with around 2k to go, I don't know if that was caused by... What you saw with, with about 3K to go, 4K to go, Ineos made it to the front. Now they don't have a sprinter. They don't care about sprinting. They just need to get to the front. They're jostling for position to make sure they get under that 3K banner so they know that they're gonna get the same time if any splits do occur. But what I'm thinking nowadays is that once they're under that, they, they all tend to shut off and let the sprinter teams take, take control for the last 2K, one and a half K. So what you've got in effect is you've got this big rush to the first finish line of the 3K banner. So that's where you get all the GC riders working, 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 coming through, as well as a few of the sprint teams. But then as soon as they're over 3K to go, they don't need to be involved. So they back off a little bit, which then you've got, you've got riders coming off the front who were smashing it, taking it a bit easier. Then you've got the real, real out and out sprint teams pushing themselves to the front. So you can't help thinking that there's always going to be a touch of wheels and, and it must be even more dangerous doing that than it is everybody just going and just hammering it and just stretching it all out. So apart from Turnison being up there to take the yellow jersey on the first stage, wasn't really many surprises within the, the sprint finish. Just a shame Gurnervegen couldn't have been up there to, um, to challenge for that win and, and make me look like I know what I'm talking about. 
In the hunt for the polka dot jersey, Greg Van Avermet went up the road. He obviously wanted to show his face at the front of the race, but once he'd achieved his objective of trying to get that King of the Mountains polka dot jersey, he retired back to the peloton and there was only three riders up the road. And there we go, I think I've just about covered everything we need to talk about in that stage. If there's anything else I've missed out, please feel free to leave it in the comments below and you can all have your own say on the matters. Let's look at stage two now of the Tour de France. And it's obviously the team time trial. Stage two is a 27.6 kilometer team time trial. I think the best way to describe it is, is lumpy. There's no real climbs in it that's gonna drop people if they're not feeling strong enough. This is gonna be a tough time trial, however, make no mistake. The one thing you gotta bear in mind with this team time trial is there's kind of three races in one here. So you've got the team who want to win the team time trial, who's gonna be going out sole purpose to win that race. Then you've gotta be looking at the GC teams who want to put in a good time so they don't lose any time for their GC contenders. But then you've also got the race of being able to pick up that yellow jersey and spend a couple of days in the yellow jersey. In terms of GC, I can't help thinking there's gonna be some time gaps put into those GC contenders. You got the likes of Ineos. Out of the eight man roster, you've got two who are current TT champions and four former national TT champions. I think, I think it's theirs to lose tomorrow, but how much time are they gonna put into the likes of AG2R and Roman Bardet? It could, you know, his Tour de France could be over right there and then. Having a good result tomorrow could just take the shine off a few people's Tour de France's, and it might put them a bit more on the back foot than they necessarily wanted to be, and they could be thinking that their tour is over before it's even began. So tomorrow's gonna to be really interesting. My prediction so far, 0%, but I've got a feeling that Team Ineos are going to uh, stick it to everybody. But you know what? I said Dylan Grunewagen was going to win today and, and that didn't happen. So you just never know what's going to happen in the tour. Right, let's move on to the other stories making the headlines today. And after the melee of yesterday of seeing riders in thermal gear, riders with plasters on their arms, Thomas de Ghent took to Twitter to have his say on the matter. These kind of threads are hilarious. Bandage equals blood transfusion. Long sleeves equals blood transfusion. What they don't know is that on Thursday, we all have UCI blood testing morning at 7.30 and we go out a training hour and a half later when it's only 17 degrees at time. Idiots. Replying to the tweet, riders have blood drawn as part of their pre-race medical and anti-doping checks. Yeah, blood test yesterday morning. As for other dressing, sometimes guys just want a good sweat after all that travel. I kind of like the fact that these riders actually call this stuff out. Because the majority of the time, I, I guess the PR people behind teams are saying just don't engage in these people. But it's always nice when they do and just kind of set the record straight and they're like, should be in dicks. This is why this happened. Also in the news, Nibble is still undecided whether he's going to try and go for GC or the polka dot jersey. He still doesn't know. He's worried that if he puts all his eggs into the GC basket and he feels crap after a couple of weeks, that he'll have regretted not going for the polka dot jersey. My opinion, go for the polka dot jersey. Stop kidding yourself that you might win this Grand Tour. I c and I'm sorry if there's any Nibbly fans out there. I just can't see it. Now, when I read this story, I wasn't too sure if it was a storyline from Narcos or Line of Duty or what the hell was going on. But then it turns out it was just real life and, and it, and it kind of sucks. In some respect, it sucks because Jack Bobridge has been put behind bars for four years. Two-time Australian road champion, two-time Olympic silver medalist on the track, was convicted of four charges of supplying a total of 301 ecstasy pills to fellow former racer Alex McGregor between March and August of 2017. Who am I to judge? I don't know what's gone on in his life. He had to retire from cycling due to rheumatoid arthritis, so maybe that played a part in it. It, it must be difficult going from the, the heights that he, he achieved. Olympic medals, track world championships, Delhi Commonwealth Games gold medal. It must be difficult to, to have reached those peaks and then have had to stop because of, well, through no fault of your own. And, and then again, you just don't know what's going on in someone's personal life. You see cyclists smiling and, and, and giving happy interviews and winning things and, and being at the top of the game, but that's only for a short period of time and you never see what these riders get up to in their personal lives. So you never know what kind of problems a rider is dealing with and maybe maybe he was just dealing with a lot of problems and he thought that was the answer and unfortunately it clearly wasn't and now he's got to um, he's got to do the time for the crime. That's my only rhyme. So this is Evan Cycles getting Geraint Thomas, one of the most patient people on Twitter, on his bike in July. Not the Geraint Thomas by the way.
you like me. Evan Cycles, in my opinion, doing some top quality marketing. However, the marketing team at Wiggle are gonna to have to pull the finger out after Sam Bennett tweeted them last week. Hey Wiggle Sport, where is my order placed on 24th of June? It hasn't even been processed. Having to borrow a pump for me tires every morning is getting frustrating. Sort it out. I don't know who's got it worse. Wiggle having a professional cyclist call them out for not dispatching an order. Or Sam Bennett for not even having a pump. I don't know. So that's it. Tour de France 2019 is underway and it went with a bang. Leave your comments down below. Let me know who you think is going to win tomorrow and any other comments you want to leave, feel free. Just, just do it down below. Don't forget, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell if you've not done already. And until tomorrow, 